on May the 4th, 1919, exactly 100 years ago, more than 3,000 students took to the streets to protest against the diplomatic failure of the Beiyang government at the Paris Peace Conference, where German interests in China's eastern province of Shandong was transferred to Japan. The movement soon spread across the country. Those students might not have known then, but what they did on that particular day inked a new chapter in China's history. 100 years on, China has rejuvenated closer to the center of the world than ever before. To commemorate the May the 4th movement and reveal the spirit within it, today I'm happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Wang Yiwei, Jean Monet Chair Professor of Renmin University of China, Professor Li Jinzhao from Beijing Foreign Studies University, and River Xi, an analyst at Legend Holdings. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Today is, of course, a very special day for the whole of the country in that exactly 100 years ago, May the Fourth Movement, uh, in fact, uh, changed the course of China's development in terms of nation making. Now, President Xi Jinping delivered a historic speech commemorating this event. Yi Wei and all of you may have uh, you know, followed the televised uh, ceremony quickly. Yi Wei, what are your major thoughts about the major points that the President Xi Jinping delivered on this very special occasion? I think the new era of the new patriotism is uh, more works for the uh, regeneration of the Chinese nation and also contribute to the community of shared future. Jin Zhao? My take is that uh, uh, President Xi is calling for concerted efforts from Chinese uh, younger generation because China is entering a new era, a new century, uh, and uh, we have new responsibility globally. So we need uh, all the contribution possibly made by the younger generation. Looking back in your review, River, do you think President Xi dwelled more upon the past 100 years, or did he aim to look into the future for yet another 100 years, uh, forward-looking, or do you think it's more about a review of uh, the spirit of May the Fourth Movement? Yeah, I think he did both. And also, I think he, what he inspires me a lot is that he called the attention of the society to nurture and to create an environment for the young people to grow even faster and the call the attention of a lot of you know, other resources to help the young generation to, you know, um, to, to take more responsibility. I think he not only look into the past or future, but also help us to be more confident in the present, in the present. and also that makes me really happy. What do you think of the sense of history in his speech? in President Xi Jinping's presentation about what that particular chapter of the history exactly 100 years ago meant for, for example, uh, uh, safeguarding the independence of the national sovereignty, uh, the sense of a patriotism, as well as uh, a fight against imperialism, which was unfair to the territorial integrity of China following the end of the First World War. And perhaps you can also briefly go back to what President Wilson of the United States stood for in his 14-point uh, proposal. Indeed, uh, I think the four keywords of the uh, May Forcement spirit First is patriotism, second is progress, first is progress. Third, uh, third is democracy, missed democracy, and missed science is the four. Uh, the May Force Movement is about uh, not just a, a political uh, revolution and uh, social movement, but as well as uh, the cultural enlightenment. Mm. So during that time, the cultural enlightenment is we, uh, because colonized by the West, so we blame our traditional culture. Uh, and then I think that's maybe we rethink about that. Today, I think uh, it's not just the Western lines of the Chinese culture. It's like my uh, dress, you know, this is a youth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, jacket. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's from the, uh, the use of the mm -hmm. 100 years ago, but same time, we mix together with the West. Mm -hmm. So it's like Chinese, Chinese, China is old, but it's young. It's Chinese, it's also Western lines. So that mixed together, I think mm -hmm. that's different from the spirit. And given uh, the main force mo movement, uh, historical significance, I think it's uh, because it's a starting point of the Chinese new democratic revolution. Before, China colonized by, uh, by so many uh, Western powers, but no hope. At one time, when the, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the president of the United States, had the 14 points, which claimed that the 
uh, uh, colonized. I think that's the uh, political independence, uh, territory integrity. Mm -hmm. But just one year, when the Paris Conference mm -hmm. suspended the Chinese territory, uh, Shandong, and from Japan to Germany, uh, from Germany to Japan, you know, that makes the Chinese okay cannot trust any Western countries. And then one year later, they read, uh, the October Revolution sent us the Marxism and started the uh, Communist Party's leadership. So I think that the future 100 years is more under the Chinese Communist Party leadership. So today, patriotism is about the new China. It's about socialist China under the Communist Party leadership. So loves China, loves Communist Party, loves socialism. So that's, the, I think, the today's use. Uh, spirit. Exactly. Two years after the outbreak of May 4th movement, uh, we had the birth of the Chinese Communist Party in Shanghai in 1921. So it came as a no surprise that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, laid overwhelming uh, emphasis on the importance of the relevance of mm -hmm. May 4th movement for the birth and the creation of uh, the Communist Party of China, mm -hmm. the biggest uh, ruling party in the world. But it seems we have uh, two entirely different causes mm -hmm. on the, uh, when we commemorate the May the Fourth Movement. One is the importance of a communist movement, uh, mm -hmm. particularly influence of the uh, former Soviet Union on our formation of the Chinese Communist, Ma communist mm -hmm. Party. The other is uh, the alleged total negation of a traditional Chinese culture, mm -hmm. uh, which was characterized very much by Confucianism. Mm -hmm. uh, there, therefore, we have the new cultural movement that uh, came along with uh, the student movement. Right. So, what do you think of the two entirely different discourses? Mm. Actually, they converge perfectly, uh, and that brings about the mission, the historical mission of the communists in China. The May Fourth Movement, being part of the new cultural movement, uh, advocates democracy and science. And May 4th movement in particular, actually, according to Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, is the most radical movement against uh, feudalism and against imperialism. And he makes it really clear that the core, the nature of May 4th movement is its uh, fundamental and most radical anti-imperialist, anti-feudalistic stance. And on the other hand, we had the uh, Russian Revolution that uh, demanded or that suggested the overthrow of the former empires. So that shed a new light on China's new direction to save the nation's uh, destiny. So, and actually, the communist, the young communists in China at that time, in the 1919 and to 1921, they actually they represented a new social class because I'm a sociology professor, so I look at it from social movement perspective. At that time, the new social class was the new industrial workers. So the industrial workers also had the need of fighting against the imperial and the feudal rule in China. So the two sides converged very well, very perfectly. That brought about the rise of the Communist Party in China. River, at the same time, a third possible discord may also capture attention of academics uh, mm -hmm. in their debates on nation making, starting from the Hallmark movement made for them. Uh, they would say it's the defining moment for a learning curve, for mm -hmm. importing Western values, Western science, Western democracy or democratic institutions mm -hmm. uh, to in their probe for the construction, mm -hmm. if not the reconstruction, of what made China great again. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, quoting President Trump as <laughs> in making America again. Uh -huh. But what do you think of this uh, sort of uh, allegation that May the Fourth Movement could also be the starting point of importing Western ideology, Western values, Western sciences and democracy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to resonate with the two professors, I think the May the Fourth Movement is not a standalone I mean, domestic event. It's an actually a part of international events, as you know, the Paris tr Treaty of Versailles, or a lot of you know, new era, new minds is happening in Russia at that time. So it, I think it's more like a patriotic reaction of the young generation in China to face the unbalanced structure after the World War One. So actually resonate with what's happening outside the country, what's happening in the whole world. 
So it definitely the events paved the way for you know global ideas to come to China and also awake the public, the, the vast majority, to make them aware of what's happening around the world. And as we know, Marxism actually requires the vast majority, you know, people to be accepting and to get an idea of what's happening in the world. And and I think that's how May the Fourth Spirits actually told us. The momentum and dynamics of May the Fourth Movement could somehow be defined as uh, the Chinese equivalent of the Enlightenment movement. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this process of Enlightenment uh, was uh, disrupted by the Japanese invasion of China, and therefore national salvation became uh, the theme of what the Chinese stood for in the rest of the years before 1945, the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Yiwei, what do you make of this kind of uh, uh, allegation that uh, uh, national salvation uh, took the upper hand in the process of nation making since May the Fourth Movement. That's very important. I think uh, before, uh, I think in uh, Chen Duxiu, one of the founder of the Communist Party, mm. he, he said, you know, he's 24 years old. He knows that uh, oh, China is just one of the world uh, of the mm. country in the world uh, because of tradition we are all under heaven. Mm -hmm. So, so May Fourth Movement is very important to uh, of the uh, cultural enlightenment that China actually defeated and uh, by all the Western powers. So we should save our nations, we should learn from the West, democracy and uh, science. So and then until two years later, the Communist Party was founded and then, and then learned from Russia because uh, uh, of the, we disappointed with all the kind of their uh, reason. We learned from the West. Uh, Democrat, you know, uh, people, uh, Republic of China uh, founded the, uh, seven, uh, uh, eight years ago before the May enforcement. Not so successful. See, we were and ultimately led the movement <laughs> in founding in the founding of the Republic of China. Yeah. And then I think all kinds of the uh, choices uh, cannot get out of uh, the uh, imperialism and uh, uh, colonialism. So I think that's a reason the Communist Party and the hold of the flag of the uh, communism. And then that's the we say this is the natural historical choice mm. of China because we tried many all others mm. but failed. Yeah. Actually, All other efforts have been exhausted, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, exactly. we ended up opting for mm -hmm. uh, the communist leadership mm -hmm. in uh, uh, navigating the course of uh, national salvation, uh, in defeating the Japanese aggression, yeah. and in the funding itself yeah. of the PRC yeah. in 1949. Yeah. Jindal, what do you want to say yeah, about Actually, I want to add that uh, the 1911 revolution was meant to be very radical, but uh, after the founding of mm -hmm. Republic of China, the, the government then, the Republican government then, had to make a lot of compromises mm -hmm. with different forces in China, mm -hmm. foreign forces and also a lot of warlords. Mm -hmm. So uh, then the mission claimed by the 1911 movement was diluted, mm -hmm. was very much uh, uh, missing. Mm -hmm. So then there was this new urge. And uh, the other point I want to add that during the time of the transferring of the communist mm -hmm. idea into China, actually there were a lot of new ideologies mm -hmm. transferred from uh, foreign countries to China, including anarchism, including mm -hmm. uh, what we call the guild socialism, and also the unionism, the new country movement, m among many other things. Mm -hmm. So communist idea was only one of the of the competing ideologies mm -hmm. and the Chinese youth at that time, especially intellectuals, were looking for the best fit mm -hmm. uh, between uh, work ecology and uh, the representation of the new working class and also the masses in the countryside. It's very so interesting because we uh, have eight uh, we said democratic parties, well, you know, actually it's a pattern of parties of the Communist Party which most of them founded during anti-Japanese uh, aggression. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the ideas is also made for movement to want to save our nation. So mm -hmm. different kinds of ideas. Only the Communist Party succeed in bringing China into a new stage. And uh, the, the reason I think uh, May, moves, uh, May Force movement started trans uh, the power shift from Germany to Japan. You know, we colonized by the Western European countries, many, many of them. But uh, Japan, traditionally Chinese think about it, we, we are super, you know, civilization super to Japan. The Jap Japan is also a student of the European powers. But now, you know, transfer from Germany 
to Japan, okay. our territory with the Shandong province. So that started the Chinese, oh, we are not just defeated by the West, we defeated by uh, Japan, you know, the new colonial uh, imperialist power, mm -hmm. same thing, Jiawu, uh, 1895. So make these Chinese, you know, I think the uh, cultural enlightenment is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You are watching Dialogue with the River Xi, Jin Zhao Li, and uh, Yi Wei Wang. We are discussing impact of May the 4th Movement exactly 100 years ago upon the nation-making of China. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We have a Chinese uh, saying, uh, all rivers find their way into the sea. Now, that might be uh, meant to be a joke uh, in terms of uh, the starting point of May the Fourth Movement. Actually, um, uh, Peking University uh, was the cradle, mm -hmm. was the birthplace of the May the Fourth Movement. The 3,000 students uh, came out of the campus and took to the street in protest against the diplomatic failure. You graduated from what is called the Beijing University, but uh, it was called yeah, was. Peking University. Now, what do you think of uh, the spirit of uh, Beida students? Well, I'm speaking, if you, you know, grab a random Peking University graduate and ask him or her what is made for movement spirit, he or she may not be able to, you know, give you a proper answer. But I think deep, you know, deep inside our mind, this is what distinguishes us from, you know, graduate from from other universities, you can that I mean, I study in China and United States and France. I can easily see from the alumni club of Peking University all over the world that I mean we are different. And more importantly, whenever we come from any difficulties, I think the made of force immense spirits is kind of like a internal supporting system that provides a lot of guts and tools for us to overcome the difficulty. And I think that's the key, and that's already enough. But what do you think of the uh, dynamics of this kind of uh, inspirations? Mm -hmm. You feel inspired by this part of the history concerning Beida, but uh, is it more about uh, uh, patriotism, uh, your love for science, or is it about the Western idea of individual liberty? Mm -hmm. uh, which part today would help shape what a Beida student actually is in terms of uh, their innovation and uh, entrepreneurship <laughs> or to uh, achieve the um, academic brilliance? <laughs> well, I think you, you bring out a really good point, that is innovation. I think, well, the young people, think about it, the young people actually innovate the made of poor spirit. Mm -hmm. it's, um, they, I think the, what young people do is just view the old problem with the new eyes. Uh, just give the new, provide new solutions to old problems. Just break the stereotypes or what people perceive as normal for decades. They just, you know, be something new. I think that's the key. That's already enough. I mean, we can learn from that. So what it brings from us, for us today, is to maybe give the young people more space and freedom so let them, you know, come up with new ideas. And that, I believe, will give us a lot of positive surprises. You know, uh, River, your reply reminds me of a, a very interesting interview that I conducted at least 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a dialogue, a, a post of history of 20 years this year, exactly 20 years. One of them was very interesting. It's about a young uh, American Communist Party member mm -hmm. who came to join the uh, Chinese Communist Party, Yin Yan Oh, wow. So many years after the founding of the PRC, I did an interview about uh, uh, her comments on her own life mm -hmm. in the Red China. She said, when you look at the roller coaster development and evolution of the Communist Party and the uh, bang pay road, the national making in the PRC, you have to got the three things in your mind. Mm -hmm. One is a sense of history, one is a sense of justice, mm -hmm. and uh, one is a sense of uh, humor. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, she went through the leftist, uh, uh, chaotic, uh, mm -hmm. tumultuous period of the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. and fortunately she was able to survive mm -hmm. uh, the political movement. Anyway, uh, what do you think of, uh, say, the sense of history for every Chinese? This country has a long hi history of 5,000 years. Do we have to keep the history in mind, or we'd rather like the behavior of the Beijing University students, uh, adopt a forward-looking attitude. This is a Russian saying that uh, <coughs> if you um, forget the history, you lose one eye, 
if you are just uh, digging in the history, uh, forget the future, and then you lose two eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we should learn the lessons from history, indeed. But we, we are, you know, respect the history is for the future. So today, I think the May Fourth Movement, the spirit, patriotism, as the President Xi uh, defined in his speech, is more about the current shoulder that the youth hold for the Chinese uh, regeneration and also for the humanity. He said. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because in China, I think uh, more than one fourth of the uh, population actually they are youth, uh, from 14 years to 35 years mm -hmm. old, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's more than 400 million. So lots of a lot. Let's make China very dynamic and very. Uh, this is the Chinese future, mm -hmm. and also as the future of the human, uh, human being. You know, today they are uh, the youth is a fancy topic in all the conference. The youth forum, young leaders, mm -hmm. you know, the Arab Spring start from the youth employment. So I think today we, we celebrate with the centenary or the May Fussman. It's focused on what we can do for the youth, for the future innovation, for a bright future for our nation and for the human being. Let me go back to one renowned scholar in the closing days of the Qing dynasty, the last feudal dynasty, uh, if you look at the 5,000 years history. Liang Shiqiu, uh, Liang Qitao, sorry. Liang Qitao said, Shao nian qiang, zhe zhong guo qiang. It means that when the young people get stronger, the whole nation will be powerful as a result. Today, when we look at uh, the values, the lifestyle, education, uh, quality of their life, of young Chinese, what kind of uh, inspirations or mixed feelings you can have through your examination mm -hmm. of their minds, their, the way they were educated? Yeah. Thank you for asking me. I do have mixed feelings <laughs> towards the younger generation. On the one hand, looking at all social movements and social uh, turning points in China, actually almost all of them are either led or dominated or manpowered by young people. All peasant revolutions all historical terms, uh, we only name the main force one, the youth movement. Actually, mm -hmm. all historical movements are predominantly represented or manpowered by younger generation. So I think uh, we really value the vitality in the youth spirit and uh, the ingenuity, the creativity. But I think, on the other hand, we really have to caution against those younger generation, the Red Guards, who uh, persecuted their professors to death during the Cultural Revolution, I don't think that kind of violence, mm -hmm. that, that kind of uh, uh, senseless struggle, um, treating everyone as enemies, lacking proper education mm -hmm. about the world, about the historical mission of the China, of a Chinese society. I think so we really have to caution against that kind of blind um, blind extremism or blind enthusiasm. The uh, zealotry and the misbehavior right. of what you call the young radicals during the Cultural Revolution were actually motivated by uh, leftist ideology, but today the context of a uh, national uh, reconstruction, economic reconstruction, is completely different mm -hmm. from uh, I agree, uh, yeah. from uh, the Cultural Revolution. And therefore, do you think uh, young people would go back to the radical behavior uh, and fall victims to extremism? Uh, uh, we may not have extremism, uh, but the populism no. and nationalism uh, might be the derivatives of a kind of uh, uh, patriotism. Do you, what, what do you well, think of this kind of uh, dangerous relevance? Well, I think, I mean, President Xi in his speech today or you know, earlier, he raised a really good point is that we should study the young people. I mean, we, we should have a sense of not only, you know, inject or just let them tell us what they're thinking, but also we should study them, study and think about what they're thinking. And then after we know what they're thinking, we can provide a experience and also an easier to accept way to help them, to nurture them, to help them overcome their loss of senses, their inexperience, in, or their, you know, easy to be misused or mis, you know, yeah. attracted, misattracted by, you know, some, you know, 
voodoos or what, whatever wrong mm -hmm. perceptions they probably have. So I think the steps is to study them, to know what they're thinking, and to help them in a way that they can accept. Uh, in a way, we have the constant concerns about the young people movement being turned into mob culture, majority tyranny. Uh, that's the nightmare that we went through during the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yiwei, uh, your common sense about uh, healthy development of young people's mindset in the new context, please. I think the young uh, people are a uh, means of innovation uh, because you, you, we use so many new technologies, mm -hmm. uh, AI and the digital economy and all this. Most of the important innovations from the youth people. <laughs> even the president she said, uh, mostly, you know, even social scientists, social sciences as well. The, when the Karl Marx uh, published the you know, Communist Manifesto, it's only 30 years old. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But uh, natural science, engineering, definitely, uh, yeah. I think the most from the, the young people. So today, I think, uh, even younger, mm -hmm. even my child is only 12 years old, but he learned a lot from, because of the computer, mm -hmm. internet, and uh, it seems uh, lots of the innovative You look ideas. at the average age of uh, astronauts, uh, those uh, mainstream uh, uh, backbone uh, researchers uh, in the mega project of, uh, say, Beidou. Mm -hmm. uh, President Xi probably uh, spoke of this mm -hmm. special group of people with the average age of uh, below 35 or yeah. uh, around 35. That's very promising, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, so w w are you confident that uh, mm -hmm. China will survive the current trade war and the China bashing campaign by the United States? I mean, of course, very confident. I mean, we're equipped in both mentally and physically and in both natural science and social science knowledge to, you know, build our own future and also contribute internationally to a globalized world. I think we're also very confident. In fact, a lot of the young people are discussing, either off the record or openly, whether unilateralism, which motivates very much the behavior of President Trump and the U.S. government, will, serve, will threaten to alienate those young people who are actually educated in the United States and they came back with the American dream. This is a very paradoxical and meaningful for the American authorities to really reflect upon their China policy. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.